the government notified 15 candidates for seats on the new city council. And they held meetings in Burden Hall on August 17 and September 14. Chair Ray Murphy, and some of us in this room remember Ray, announced that each candidate would be given an opportunity to speak and urged each one to promote incorporation in order to preserve Loma Linda's identity. So that means that on September 22 of this year, Loma Linda will celebrate its 40th anniversary. I'd like to ask you to stand for a brief invocation and pledge of allegiance. Would you please stand? Father God, we thank you for the many opportunities that you give us to serve our fellow man. We pray that your blessing would be on this meeting this evening. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Please help me welcome our moderator for this evening, Gloria Anderson from the San Bernardino League of Women Voters. There are five candidates for two seats, and your ballot will tell you you may vote for only two of the five candidates. Um, candidates have drawn for their order of speaking, and they will start from my left to right, and um, we will then have questions from the audience. and. will be checked over for um, duplication and that kind of thing. So get busy writing, and if things occur to you as the speakers are speaking, we ask that you stick to the issues and not ask a question of a specific candidate. We want to focus on the issues and what these candidates intend to do if they are elected. Uh, and we're going to kind of stay away from personalities that will help you decide who would be the best person to represent you in these two council seats. Um, the uh, council, council member who is trying for another term is Robert Ziprick, but Floyd Peterson is retiring, so that seat is open. Um, the uh, two questions that we have asked them to cover in their opening statements, which will be three minutes long, are what is the number one issue facing candidate, uh, residents of Loma Linda, and what would you do to solve it and if elected, what would be your goals for Loma Linda? Now, the League of Women Voters also has a history that's a little bit longer 
than the city of Loma Linda. Uh, the National League was actually founded before women had the right to vote, and that was 90 years ago in February. The San Bernardino League is celebrating its 55th year of serving voters in the San Bernardino area. And right now, we are the only league in the county, but we can't possibly cover the whole county. So we're, we're sticking mostly to the San Bernardino area. Um, we have voter information on the shelf in the back. It's the Easy Voter Guide, which has information on the propositions, and I have tons of them in my car besides these. So if you want to take a supply, I can get them for you. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization, which means we never oppose or support candidates. We do, however, take positions on issues that we have studied. And you will see, um, if you go to our um, state league site, lwvc.org, what our positions are on the uh, ballot measures for June. Um, so, without further ado, uh, again, I welcome you and commend you for taking the time to come to this live program in which you can meet your potential candidates. Um, so, um, I don't think it's necessary for me to get into it too far. I just rely on you to use common courtesy and save your applause until the end. Uh, okay, we'll begin with the open sta opening statements of the candidates, and the first one is Ron Daly. Thank you, Gloria. I've written a few comments in order to ensure that I'm succinct and able to stay within the designated time. As a res resident of this community for over 30 years, I have been fortunate enough to raise a wonderful family and make some amazing friends in Loma Linda. I am not a professional politician, nor do I intend to become one. I am a regular citizen, just like all of you, and, uh, but I believe it's time that I take advantage of the opportunity to give something back to the city that I've lived in for so many years. In recent years, I have noticed a troubling trend in local politics apparent political horse trading, unclear motives, and a diminished spirit of collaboration among council members. With the retirement of longtime council member and friend Floyd Peterson, I felt it was the right time to step forward and get involved. I have a very straightforward campaign platform, provide open, honest, and transparent leadership on the city council enhance economic development by supporting our existing businesses and employers and attract new businesses to Loma Linda. Three, maintain the highest level of public safety for our residents. And four, improve the transportation network in Loma Linda. Over the course of this evening, I'm sure we will be addressing in one way or another each of those four issues. I'd like to uh, touch on the first one as uh, a problem that I think needs to be addressed. Provide open, honest, and transparent leadership on the City Council. Let me illustrate that with uh, just one example. Um, the university put up a new building called Centennial Complex. Part of that plan that was approved was to expand Stewart Street with all of the increase in student traffic flow across that, uh, that street. Um, when the university came back to seek funding, the funding was held up by uh, two councilmen. Motives are unclear to me, but uh, ultimately, if you drive down Stewart Street, there continues to be K rails on the side. The project continues to be unfinished. It's disturbing because uh, Although there were, I understand, traffic studies that were done, uh, nonetheless, I've seen traffic, I've sat in traffic that's backed up. Ultimately, two students have been hit while crossing Stewart Street, resulting in the university 
uh, purchasing or spending uh, in the neighborhood of $10,000 to put a crosswalk in, which has helped make it more safe, but it also is hard on traffic when a class gets out and the student, all the students are punching the traffic light. Thank you, I look forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you, Gloria. <clears throat> Um, I'd like to start out, um, again, I echo uh, my, my friend Ron's statement that I do not intend to be a professional politician. Um, I'm currently employed as a, a sergeant with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. I love my career and I plan on continuing that for some years. Um, my wife and I chose to, to purchase our first home here and I love this city as I grew up here and have spent almost, uh, most of my life here. Um, I've also become increasingly alarmed with some of the things that have been developing in the city and other surrounding cities. Uh, I believe that one of our main um, issues facing Loma Linda as well as many other communities in the coming years is the uncertain fiscal future and what's happening with, um, with the country as far as our, our, our money and our finances. And I believe um, we have to be very careful on what we do and, and the decisions that we make. Um, if, if elected to the city council, I have a few things also that I would like to make known. I would like to make sure citizens are told the truth about what is happening in their community, that there is open, transparent government, like Ron says, that everybody knows what's going on and has a voice in, in making those decisions. I obviously do promote peace and safety um, and that's by ensuring that we are covered with adequate police and fire protection. Again, we live only a stone's throw away from cities like San Bernardino and Colton and places that are having problems with those issues. And we, although we are very safe and we are very well protected, I want to ensure that that continues as we continue to grow. I'd like to continue to preserve our open spaces, both in the hills and the valleys, because I believe the citizens have spoken and that's important to all of us. And I do also wanna work constructively with Loma Linda University and other major businesses and small businesses here within the community to make sure that we're balancing the needs and desires of the community as a whole. And finally, again, back to keeping Loma Linda fiscally sound, um, I believe that lesser included issues with our, our finances and the budget um, is managing our infrastructure, controlling our traffic, and again, keeping the threat of crime at bay. So my name is Phil Duper. I welcome the opportunity to, to be here and express some of my views. And uh, I thank you and the, the League of Women, Women Voters for inviting me. And I'll try to stay as brief and concise as I can. pleasure for me to be here tonight and I would like to thank each one of you for being here also to listen and to observe and to understand what we're trying to accomplish. I too am not a politician. I have grown up in this area. I was born in the old hospital on the hill which many of you may remember. I still remember playing in those sidewalks up there in the steps while my mother was in seeing the doctors. It still has a lot of very nice memories for me. Number one issue for the city as I see it are a number of things, uh, one of which is the parking problems that we're encountering all the time, the added traffic issues to deal with, and then we have a lot of sidewalks in the community that, are, that have lips that are some two inches high that are excellent opportunities for a lawsuit for the city if people who jog and run and walk the neighborhoods can stumble, it'd be an excellent lawsuit against the city. There are a lot of things that uh, could be done. I plan on using the sources available to me, researching the issues that come to the board or to the council, and discussing those with my associates, and also uh, talking with others uh, in the community. I believe that the council can best rep be represented if we listen to you as citizens with an openness and a fairness and honesty and transparency. Further diligence in studying the various issues will bring good results in our best interest for everyone concerned. And uh, I look forward to working with each one of you as you can call me on my cell phone 
It's available on the flyer that's in the lobby. You can call me at any time you care to, and I will answer your calls. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Robert Christman. Good evening. My name is Bob Christman. I have been on the council before. I don't think that qualifies me as a professional politician, but I have been on the council, and I enjoyed my time on the council. Just last weekend, my wife and I went to a Southern Gospel Music Fest up in Visadia, California, and it was a wonderful experience. On the way home, I told my wife, I said, I'm uh, not sure that I want to <clears throat> go back into that campaign because I feel like the last campaign got kind of down and dirty and nasty. When I did get back, I saw some hit pieces that had come out, and uh, it bothered me. And I couldn't tell where the distortion stopped and where the lies started. When I mentioned that to someone, they said, well, is there a difference? So nonetheless, uh, we have already started out with a fairly difficult campaign. But before I came in this evening, someone again admonished me. Keep it positive. And that's what I want to do. I want to keep it positive. I want to tell you what I want to accomplish for the city and also what has been done in the past. First of, you, or first of all, for the last 16 years that I was on the council, we had a balanced budget. No phony numbers, no gimmicks, honest to goodness, balanced budget. Unfortunately, that's not the case right now. And part of that is because of some lawsuits, some frivolous lawsuits brought against the city. And the city council has imposed a fire slash paramedic tax to help pay for that. I think that tax should be repealed. There's other ways to balance the budget rather than to put people to where they have to be concerned about calling for fire or paramedic help. Other issues for the city are that we need to do more on the business development side. I'm very proud of the fact that we significantly expanded the business corridor along Redlands Boulevard. And as most of you would recognize, that will help significantly building up the for-profit tax base for the city. We need to do that. I noticed that Fresh and Easy has been there for two years, and we worked hard to get that business into town, and it still hasn't opened. Another high priority for me would be to get the Anderson Tippecanoe Interchange done. I helped arrange to get the financing for that. We got $50 million that is sitting there waiting to be used. And for whatever reason, that project has been stalled and delayed during the last two years. I would like to get that project back on track. And I believe that means my time is up. I do have a brochure out, and it's bobchrisman.org if you want to find out more about my campaign. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Robert Zippert, the Thanks. incumbent. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate the League of Women Voters and the Chamber of Commerce putting this on. When I got involved in the city council many years ago, 12 years ago, it was as a volunteer concerned about the South Hills. That issue has been a big issue for the city since the late 1980s. And I became pretty passionately involved. Uh, there were incidents in the hills uh, where people would like to go up there and have recreation and hike and mountain bike. And some of the landowners got concerned. And there was even a gentleman who fired a shotgun over people's heads to try to get them to leave. So gradually, the council, with the committees, the Trails Committee, Parks, Historical, Parks and Historical Society, all got together. and task force the Trails Committee was put together, what shall we do? And the city came together and purchased, starting, and frankly, uh, Mayor Christman at that time uh, with, with others, pushed extremely hard to get the land purchased. And in four land purchases, we acquired almost 2,000 acres. That has brought to basically a successful conclusion a very large issue in the city. Looking to the future, and, and I think there's some improvements that could still be done, some expansion of the South Hills Preserve, and it's a real amenity that we're going to be glad we have. But we're in California. 
Our economy is in terrible shape. Developing capital for public and private institutions, the city, and the university, and other organizations in town is very challenging and difficult. I support a public-private partnership, and it would be along a couple of lines. One is to work as much as we can to bring in private business. I've long felt that we would be an excellent high-tech center for biotechnology and things such as that. And that is the reason that the city originally bought the land in the northeastern side of the city. Major, that would be a major way with our amenities to attract business. Our fiber optic system is second to none. It is as good as exists anywhere in the world. And if we can capitalize on that, even in a high tax state like California, perhaps we can attract some great commercial business in here with very high paying jobs. It's an uphill fight, but it's something that's worth doing. So that is one of my primary concerns, and certainly working with the university on the public-private public partnership of maybe a bond issue to help create some parking structures, and even the Stewart Street uh, bridge, things like that could be financed through that. I think everybody knows the city has been hit very, very hard by the state, so we're going to have to get very innovative to come up with funding for things like that. Thank you very much for your uh, consideration. Thank you. Uh, now comes the fun part. We um, are letting you suggest questions. Uh, there have been some that have been submitted beforehand. One of them was already covered. Um, but if we have time, I'll uh, ask if you have any further comments on why you are running for city council. Um, the, First question, and some of you have maybe touched on this, but this is a chance to re reiterate it. What has been your involvement in the city of Loma Linda before you became a candidate? And we'll start on this end. I got interested in the community when we first moved here in 1964. I joined the Chamber of Commerce shortly after that, I think in about eighth grade, worked on the incorporation uh, walking precincts for it. After I went away to college and uh, law school, I came back, became involved with the Historical Commission. That was a lot of fun. Got to chair that for a while. Uh, also helped co-chair with some colleagues. The Trail Committee worked on the 25th Anniversary Committee of the city and things such as that. Uh, I was put on the uh, <laughs> Mayor's Blue Ribbon Budget Committee that Mayor Christman put some of us on when things were extremely tight 20 years ago and uh, generally have volunteered on things, been, been interested in what was going on, uh, helped rake Digneo Park when it was first being considered as a park, and things like that, um, talking to citizens about things of interest, and uh, that would be pretty much, pretty much it. I'm a supporter of the Chamber of Commerce. Oh, I forgot to mention, they have two minutes for each of the audience questions. I don't think I used all the time, but <laughs> I yield the rest. Well. If you use less time, then we have time for more questions, so that's a good thing. Uh, Mr. Christman. Back in 1982, uh, Mayor Artis Coves at that time called me and asked if I would be willing to serve on the Citizens Budget Committee. And I served on that committee for six years. Five of those years, I was the chairman of the committee. And during that time, I felt like I got to know the city budget better than most of the council members at that time. And even one year, the city manager, for whatever reason, took off for England for six weeks at budget time. So the city budget committee, citizens budget committee, at that time basically put the budget together that year. So by the time I joined the city council, I had a firm grasp of the city's budget situation one of the things I was proudest about was the fact that back in 1983-84, we worked with the university and medical center and put, put together what was called the Loma Linda Mercantile Association or Corporation, which helped to have the university medical center through its purchasing office purchase its goods and products within the city of Loma Linda so that the city 
could benefit from the sales tax revenue. At that time, I actually had to deal with a law office locally called Ziprick and something and something and something. And I didn't know who this guy Bob Ziprick was. Since then, he's become a good friend. And uh, we put that together, and I was very proud of it because even today, the university and medical center do help in that regards to help with the city budget. And that brings in substantial dollars every year to the city coffers. So my involvement prior to joining the council was six years on the citizens budget committee. Thank you. Vern Miller. I've been a chamber member for about eight years, uh, also involved with the logistics for the annual parade that we have in town. I've also worked on the personnel committee and the traffic committee in the city of Loma Linda and enjoyed all of those areas. I'm an ambassador for the chamber. Uh, that's about it. I sing in the choir for the university church. I've been there about 15 years in the choir. So that's about it, I guess. Phil Duper. Well, I think we'll be real quick with mine. Um, I've actually been a watcher and observer for quite some time, and unfortunately due to restrictions with my career and my job, I just haven't had the opportunity or the time to get directly involved. Recently, that's changed with, um, with a promotion and a, and a, a new job assignment. Um, I do feel it is time to get involved, um, and I'm, I'm not... I'm not going to sit here and tell you about all the wonderful things that I have done in the past, but I will tell you that I will try to make sure we do the right things in the future. And I believe it is a time for a change. Um, and that's it. And Ron. As I said, I've been a resident of Loma Linda for over 30 years. Uh, up to this point, uh, my focus has been uh, raising a family and focusing on my career. Uh, I have not held active office or been directly involved in city council up to this point in time. However, uh, I've been engaged in active discussions in my community and with uh, 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 colleagues at work regarding city politics. I vote every election on whatever the issues happen to be as well as whoever the candidates happen to be. Um, in addition, I work to always try to support local businesses with my business when we have the business that I need to, to uh, purchase their products or services from. Uh, but at this point in my life, I believe that now that my children are largely grown and my career is established, it's time to plug into uh, active uh, issues in Loma Linda City, and I look forward to being more actively involved than I have been up to this point. Okay. Thank you all for your answers. Um, now let's move on to the second question. Um, and it's a little different from what we've been talking about, and it might be a little negative, but um, I guess it amounts to how can we all get along and this is in reference to some of the rather heated meetings that apparently some uh, constituents feel have taken place at city council and let's start with um, Vern. First of all I think we have to think about other people and what their feelings are and what their wishes are and put ourselves in second place. Um, I think we can be more diplomatic, I think we can be more loving and understandable and kind in our comments. Uh, other people have views as well and we don't have to think that we have the best views, but it's worth considering what other people have to say as well and then working on those views as well and uh, try to bring something good to the city and the citizens. Okay. Phil. Well, I think the, the obvious answer to that is by doing the right and honest thing, by making the right decision. And when I say that, I mean not making decisions based on who our friends or who are, cons who are contributors or who are um, people that we have business associations with. I think we need to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. 
And if we do that, there should be no argument. It should be very clear. In fact, it should be unanimous. Okay. Ron? I appreciate you raising that issue, Gloria, because it is, frankly, one of the motivating factors for me to run. Uh, I have established a career uh, as a leader and consensus builder. And uh, uh, I enjoy working in an environment that's very collegial. It does not mean that we always agree. We will frequently disagree, but it's possible to disagree in, in agreeable terms and to try to find some appropriate middle road when that's appropriate. It's not based on principle. Um, my career has been devoted to listening, uh, collecting data, seeking input from stakeholders and experts where appropriate, and uh, achieving consensus where possible and making decisions and communicating them clearly where consensus is not possible. And uh, that would be what I would strive to do as a member of the city council. Here. It's an interesting problem that in uh, the American political system, the founding fathers and mothers of the country wanted a country that had uh, freedom as a major component. And one of the challenges to maintaining that freedom is, is following the Constitution. Uh, allowing expression, and frankly, uh, allowing uh, political d discourse and debate. At the same time, one wants to encourage what they call the collegial effect. And I'd certainly say that uh, many of us ha have really tried to do that. Sometimes what will happen is if you hear something that you believe is inaccurate or a misstatement, one does feel that a response should be made. And sometimes an assumption can be made, just as a good colleague down here might say, well, we need to be transparent. If an existing council person believes we are being transparent, and then there's an assumption from a good colleague that we're not being transparent, that's what forces the necessity of a, of a response. Because otherwise, it's assumed by silence that you're agreeing that you're doing something wrong or improper. And that is the nature of our system. And in many parts of the world, one gets in serious trouble with the government if one speaks up. Here, we are blessed with the ability and the right and, frankly, the duty to speak up. But we should do so in a way that is as conciliatory as we can. And always, uh, as some of my colleagues have said in the past, when you go out of the meeting, you know, shake hands because you're all working for the public. I've had some people in the public say, get stronger in your comments. Some say, be more mild. So I try to stay in the middle. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Christmas. When I first joined the council, it was a very friendly, amiable council. We could disagree and go home as friends. That's not the case for this current council. This changed basically in the last few years, and it's distressing to see it. I would disagree with uh, Mr. Duper here. Uh, the right thing isn't necessarily cut and dried. It's a matter of opinion. There can be different opinions without hard feelings. The right thing can mean different things to different people. So one of the things that bothers me right now is that not all the candidates have even signed the campaign pledge to run a fair and honest campaign. That tells you a little bit about where the campaign might go or where the next council might go. And to me, if you're not going to run a fair and honest campaign, then you might not have a friendly council afterwards either. So I think it's incumbent that we come to the realization that you can disagree and not, somebody, not say somebody else is right or wrong. It's just a difference of opinion that's okay. That's why we have five council members instead of a dictatorship. Thank you. Okay. I think there's a subject that we sh could deal with now that is of a more general nature and along the lines of transparency and what is right and so on and so forth. 
the question that is being posed is, do you have any conflicts that will require you to recuse yourself due to conflict of interest? And we'll start with Mr. Christman. Well, that's an easy one for me to answer. I do not have any conflicts of any kind that would make it necessary for me to recuse myself. And I'm very proud of that fact because even though we all support the different institutions in the city, the current council has four conflicts of interest with employees of Loma Linda University. That makes it very difficult for this council to act on some of the issues that can be forced. And uh, I do not work for Loma Linda University Medical Center or the university, I work in Redlands. And I would have no conflict of interest. And quite frankly, that's one of the gifts that I could give the city is the best gift the citizens could have is to have a council that has no conflict of interest. It's not saying it's good or bad where somebody's employed, but the government is a separate entity. We want to keep it that way. We want the government to represent the people, not for the employees to have to either recuse themselves because of their job situation from voting on issues that come before the city. Thank you. I guess we'll go down the line and then come back. Um, Vern. I do not have any conflict of interest with any entities on campus, and it would, it would cause me to recluse myself from any meetings. I've worked for Transworld Systems for 15 years, but that's, even though the city uses our service, that's not my account, it's one of my associates' accounts, so it doesn't enter in with what I have to do. Okay, Phil? I personally do not feel like I have any conflict of interest for anything here in the city. Um, some, some may bring up the fact that I do work for the Sheriff's Department and we do contract for law enforcement services from the Sheriff's Department. Um, I'm fairly low on the food chain there, so I, I don't have any direct, uh, it doesn't make any difference to me either way how that goes. But um, I feel, feel strongly enough about the decisions I make that I would always try to do the right thing and the honest thing, and that I don't think I would ever have to worry about that. Um, and I know there has been some accusation and, and some, um, some things here on the current council and the past councils where people have been involved with various organizations and uh, because of the recusals have actually forced decisions to go ways that they shouldn't have gone. Um, I believe we do need a change on the council and I believe that the change has been progressing the right way in the last two years. We started it, we started it two years ago, we need to finish it now. Okay, Ron? I am the Executive Associate Dean of Loma Linda University School of Dentistry. As such, I am employed by Loma Linda University, so I would need to recuse myself from issues that came up relative to Loma Linda University. Having said that, um, I appreciate the question because here again, you, you're touching on one of the motives for me running for office. Um, uh, what has been deemed as pride in independence uh, has at times come across to uh, many of the people that I work with as, a, as not being particularly supportive. I'll try to use the kindest words possible of some issues that have affected uh, both the university, students in the university, and the medical center. Um, those who have experience working with me, uh, I'm sure will tell you that uh, I have no difficulty being independent. I'm an independent thinker. I'm independent minded. I don't agree with everything, uh, all decisions made either in the medical center or the university. Uh, having said that, I'm proud of my employment at Loma Linda University. Thank you. Back here. I, uh, other than uh, not voting on things within 500 feet of my resident, which is the rule that we all have to follow, I don't have any conflicts. Thank you. So have we covered that question? Okay. I would have one response if I can add a follow-up. Would that be okay? Sure. 
a comment was made earlier by uh, Ron Daly about the Stewart Street project. And uh, prior to my leaving office, I was working on funding for that project of $1.75 million and almost had it done. I believe I was one of the few people that could actually work on that project because I did not have a conflict of interest. And that's how not having a conflict of interest can really benefit not just the city, but also the institutions in the city. Okay. Um, um, can, can I, since Mr. Crispin was given the opportunity to make okay. a comment, can I make a comment about that, sure. ma'am? Okay. And my comment would be this. Um, Mr. Crispin and Mr. Ziprick um, purchased $3.8 million worth of property from campaign supporters. Is that considered a conflict? That's all. Okay. Um, this touches on a question that was emailed to the chamber, and it is about Stewart Street. In view of the current tight financial situation in the city, do you think the city should give um, two or three million dollars to the university for a tunnel on Stewart Street? And let's start with uh, Mr. Zipper. That question has to have a question prior to that as to who will own the bridge that would go over the tunnel. And when our good colleagues from the university presented that project here to the city council, that was one of the questions that was never answered. Who will actually own the bridge? A second question that was not answered was who will maintain the bridge? A third question is who will pay what share of the bridge? And actually, before those questions were answered, the university withdrew its request to the city to help fund it. I had followed up since then and requested through city staff, would that be something that we could revisit? And the answer I've had is at this point, the university is not interested in pursuing it. I will tell you, I did come up with three ways of helping fund that. One is that if the city could purchase some property from the city, or for the city, from the university. For uh, Digno Park was one of the possibilities because it's on land the university owns. Near that, a spot for an Amtrak station because Amtrak has tentatively approved us for a station. <coughs> or uh, put it to a vote and I pledge to support the vote of the people. If the people said let's spend the money, I pledge to vote in favor of that. And that suggestion came from some citizens. The third is a public-private partnership where we would do a bond issue. The university would repay it over 30 or 40 years. And I suggested that in uh, connection with a tunnel, uh, excuse me, the tunnel and uh, a parking structure that could tie a tunnel and bridge project with it that would be insured so the public would not be at risk and be paid off over many years. So it would not take direct money out of very tight city coffers but it would allow the project to be done. Okay, Mr. Christman. Prior to leaving office, I was working on two major funding sources for that particular project. One was working with the San Bernardino Associated Governments called Sandbag. The other was with Inland Valley Development Agency and the San Bernardino International Airport, along with some funds that Congressman Jerry Lewis had allocated to the city years before. There was going to be $1.75 million for that project. And I had been pushing for the city to contribute $2 million towards that project. After I left office, the funding sources that I had been working on did not materialize. I'll just put it that way. And uh, as I understand it, the university then asked for the city to make up the difference. In my opinion, it would have been very difficult for the city to increase its contribution from the $2 million level that we had talked about as being the city's contribution level. Without knowing whether we can get those other monies back on track or not, I would have a difficult time for the city to pay the $3.5 million, which was the request that was put forward by the university at that time because I did also have the same concerns that Mr. Ziprick had as to who would own it and who would maintain it. 
I had been assured from some friends at those respective agencies that they would work with me again, but that's not a promise because I don't know what their funding levels are at this point in time. So I'm not adverse to looking at it. I did work hard on it before I left office and would be more than happy to look at it again. Mr. Miller? I don't have any comment really on that issue. I'm sorry. I don't have any comment on that issue because I have not been abreast of all the goings and comings on that issue. But whatever comes up to the city council if I'm elected, I will certainly give every option my full consideration and do the both the honest and fair thing to be done. Mr. Duper? Again, I, I didn't have the internal dealings that the two uh, uh, sitting council members did at the time, but from watching uh, from the outside, uh, it, it almost seemed as if the, the council uh, sandbagged the whole project. Um, we have to understand that Loma Linda University is a big part of this city. I don't work for the university, but I understand that. And I, I'd like to bring back um, to an earlier statement where we were talking about the incorporation of the city and how everybody was meeting in Burden Hall, which was on university property years ago. So we, we have to work in close partnership with our institutions that made this city what it is. Does that mean we always do everything in favor of the university or the VA or whoever? No, but all of that now is affecting traffic flow. It's affecting public safety because that's, that Stewart Street project was not put together properly. So we are now paying for it. We're probably going to have to pay for it in the future because of the lack of appropriate decision that wasn't made years ago. Mr. Daly. I'm not sure if we're engaging in revisionist history or not, but let me tell you what I know. What I know is the project has, is currently not finished, and as I understand it, without a prospect of it being finished soon because they're, they do not have approval for the, for the uh, Stewart Street project. That I know. I know that uh, because of the uh, negotiating and discussions uh, and the additional complexity to, to, that's been brought to all of this, that the, uh, there are two students who have been hit uh, uh, leading to the, the lights in the crosswalk that I referred to earlier. What I do know is there is a lot of traffic during certain times of the day there, uh, and it is a mess. Uh, my office looks out on Anderson, and I can see traffic back up Anderson Street from Stewart Street. What I do know is that the university approached and attempted to work with the city uh, to share the costs of that uh, because a city street is, a, a, uh, is typically owned and operated by the city. And it seemed to me that it would be appropriate that the university share the expenses. But students are important citizens in our community as well. And I think that uh, the city would also benefit from uh, enhancing that. By the way, it's not a tunnel. Uh, there's an overpass, but it'll be a large uh, bowl area that uh, I've seen drawings of that would be very, very attractive. So there's no tunnel. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is related um, in that it's about traffic congestion um, and managing same uh, and there's also a component um, of managing it when development can have off-site parking lots and I hope I'm conveying a, a question that can be <laughs> answered but it's basically how do you manage traffic congestion and let's start with uh, Phil Well, um, that's one of the main reasons that I wanted to get involved in this race, uh, and that's our, our horrible traffic conditions that we have in the city. And I personally believe that they have been created over the last several years due to the uncontrolled growth, and a lot of that is based on developers having free reign over this city and control of, I believe, the council. Um, I do believe in controlled growth, but I believe we need to make our developers 
implement proper plans for infrastructure to build us the adequate roads. We can't just let them come in and slap houses on every slab that's open in the city. It contributes to the living environment for the rest of us. So we do need to plan ahead. We do need to take looks at that. Um, but our current council has, has been sitting for combined quite a few years. I, I believe it was 32 years or something to that effect. And what have we done to solve any of our traffic problems at this point? Okay, Vern. I have certainly seen the traffic getting worse and worse and more congested as time goes by and been involved in it as most of you have as well. I think there's a number of ways that we can attract, that we can uh, get involved with the traffic congestion and that is to make suggestions to the city and to all the powers that be that would make that possible to alleviate some of the congestion. One of which was a bridge from the medical center to the FMO and alleviating some of the traffic of all the vans that now travel between all the points here on campus. But apparently that was not approved or was looked upon with uh, some reason why they didn't want to do it. Maybe there's expense involved. And there's been some other things. Multiple level parking structure, the medical center would be ideal as far as handling a lot of the people that come to the medical center every day for treatment. Uh, and it would alleviate people having to park away from the medical center and walk in like they have to do presently. So I will look at all the options if I'm uh, elected as a councilman and see what can be done in that area. Mr. Christman. Thank you. Well, there's two things that have been in process or are in process. One of them is that I'm very proud of the fact that we got the funding and actually got Mountain View Bridge widened. And as all of you know in this room, that project was finished just within the last few months. And that took a long time. Uh, much more difficult to, real, to deal with the railroad companies than I ever realized. Uh, they took forever to approve the bridge over their property even though we had funding from the state of California and everything else worked out. The other is that the funding for the Anderson I-10 interchange is in place, approximately $50 million. The design has been approved. During the last two years, from all accounts, that project has slipped approximately four years on the schedule. And I would like to see that project get back on track, and that's one of the commitments I'm going to make, is to talk to the people at San Bernardino Associated Governments, get it back on track, get it going, and it's really too bad that it has slipped. I don't know all of the reasons. I do know that some of the council members from other cities have been very forceful in pushing their city projects forward at Sandbag, and unfortunately, I believe that has slowed down La Melinda's projects. Another area where we could work is an idea that my good friend Ziprick has put forward, and that is a public-private partnership with La Melinda University and Medical Center for parking structures. If we can use bonding authorities that the city has, and we've worked with them on bonding projects in the past, to help them put together more parking for their employees and and uh, visitors, that would be very worthwhile for them, and the city, I think, should be happy to help with a project like that. Thank you. Mr. Zipper. One of the things that we get reports on periodically at various breakfasts and lunches and dinners are the uh, growths of some fantastic enterprises in town. The VA, for one, has indicated that when it started out, and all of us have friends who work there, it was an inpatient hospital primarily. It is now mostly outpatient. The growth of the clinics there has been phenomenal. The university has had the same fantastic growth, and uh, my wife is an alumnus of the dental school, and uh, obviously <laughs> um, shares a lot of interest in the dental school with our, my friend Ron. Um, it seems like if you go through our town on the weekend, it's pretty quiet. You could walk down some of the streets here in town, and they're pretty <coughs> deserted. 
Now, Monday through Friday is a different story. Anderson Street's jammed, and, and I know that uh, just the university and its affiliates have around 13,000 employees. They're taking care of people from a, a wide radius. What I'd really like to do is work on using the assets we have, like, uh, like, like Vern and, and I think Bob Christman, some of us have been thinking along the same line, try to create a parking structure uh, maybe over Barton Road connecting both with the FMO and the medical center. That would be a tremendous help if you could close some of those crosswalks on Barton Road. That would be a great thing to do. And then work on uh, continuing the things that Bob Christman had done. He was on the council before, and I know that some other colleagues have been working on now uh, on Anderson Street, get that done. But it takes years to get things like Mountain View done. That They started working on that when I uh, when my wife was a student, and I, it was three lanes, and I said it's gonna, it looks like a problem to be having no idea that we would be dealing with it 20 years later. Thank you. Okay. Ron? Again, I want to come back to the premise of what do I know and what do I not know. What I do know is for probably the last six or eight years, traffic has been getting increasingly intense. Um, I always said I never wanted to live in Orange County but is it because I wasn't patient enough to handle the traffic. Well, now it feels like Orange County is beginning to move uh, east. Um, I appreciate that uh, the bridge, the Mountain View Bridge, has now been expanded to four lanes. I mean, that was necessary. Who builds a three-lane bridge? I mean, I never understood where that came from in the first place, but I'm, I'm very pleased that that project was, was completed. Um, I don't know what the ingress or egress options to uh, the city of Loma Linda should be, and particularly, as has been noted, the medical center, the FMO, the school of dentistry, and so forth. Uh, I do know that we need to study that carefully, and I'm aware that there has been some effort to do that. I'm also uh, believe I'm also clear in my mind that I am not a traffic expert in any sense but I have the good judgment to know my limitations and I would uh, be eager to seek uh, experts who could provide guidance and provide studies. Uh, there are people who make a living doing this and I think that we could benefit from some wise counsel. In addition to that, there are alternatives to the, the uh, automobile and I know that there are current initiatives uh, occurring in San Bernardino and other areas to uh, expand uh, mass transit system as well, and we should be carefully working with them. Okay. Here's uh, <clears throat> another uh, topic that I remember from the last forum, and it has to do with the South Hills Preserve. Um, what are your, what is your thinking on protecting the South Hills Preserve? And let's start with Vern. As an outdoor person, I enjoy walking, I enjoy nature, and at one time I was a professional trainer of crows, teaching them to talk, believe it or not, <laughs> without spreading their tongues. But I do walk the hills, and I do enjoy the open spaces, and I would certainly be for preserving the South Hills for outdoor activities of various types, biking, hiking, walking, etc. Okay, Bob? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it, or somebody asked it. I'm very proud of the purchase of the hills. Um, back in 1994, we bought the first major area of land, which was 780 acres, and we bought it from the federal government uh, because of a bankruptcy somewhere in the system, and it ended up in the hands of RTC. We paid $1.44 million for that purchase. About a year later, we bought another 60 acres from the Lita Carroll estate. Then a few years after that, we bought some land actually in Riverside County. And the reason we bought it, it was because it was at the back of our city limits and it would protect our hills and view shed. And then the last purchase we made was right before I left office, which I believe was 675 acres or thereabouts. And uh, as Mr. Duper has indicated, we bought it from a friend of mine, at least he was the leader on that, 
I believe he gave me $99 in that campaign. And uh, if that's a problem, I'll plead guilty to that problem. Because we bought that land, we had it appraised, it was a fair and honest purchase, appraised at value, and after that was done, the citizens of this city, by a 90% vote, turned that into a conservancy. And the reason we had to buy that last piece of land was so that we could complete the trail system and have a complete area that we could turn into a conservancy. Now, I noticed that one of the flyers put out by, I believe it was Save on Melinda, said that uh, we didn't need to buy it because we had zoned it out of existence anyway, or zoned it out of its value to build. That sounds almost like communism to take away somebody's property values without paying for it. Thank you. Thank you. One of the debates that has gone on for some time, and, and I, since it's been raised by uh, our colleague Phil Duper, uh, there's been a campaign for some time, uh, and frankly it's been led partly by uh, the group known as Save Loma Linda, which has campaigned on the basis of saving the hills. It is a fact that long before Save Loma Linda came into existence, there was a fairly large group of citizens working to save the hills. I was part of that group. One of the reasons I ran for city council in 1998, worked on an initiative in 1996 with people, colleagues here on the council, and earlier than that, an earlier initiative was to work towards saving the hills. But you can't save the hills, uh, as a lot of us who have been to League of Cities meetings have been informed by attorneys from, and, and Ron, you're right, we, we seek professional advice. Uh, Mr. Chris and I were at a meeting in Monterey one time, and we asked, how best do we go about acquiring these hills to protect them? And the answer we got was, you need to do density trades, or you need to purchase them. You cannot organize safely your trail system and things such as that if you have people wandering across private property. There's lots of legal ramifications. You can't even publish good maps and tell people where they can safely go uh, and treat it as an actual city park. So it was necessary to purchase these parcels, and the public has supported it through elections, through campaigns, through polls. This is the most strongly supported agenda item in the history of our city, and it is absolutely mandatory that we purchase that last piece of land because it connected the original three pieces together. The county has now given us six more acres free of charge to connect the South Hills Preserve with Hilda Crooks Park, making a complete park system. Thank you. Okay, Ron? Well, I'm getting confused. Um, first of all, the, as has been noted several times this evening, the last election was particularly contentious. My recollection is that the primary issues were the hills and uh, what kind of development there would be of those hills and measures U and V. From my perspective, those issues are over. Uh, uh, they've been adequately discussed and debated and what I hear is a consensus uh, from the candidates on the dais that uh, we all believe that the hills are a valued gem in our community and we need to try to protect them. Uh, I also believe though that some carefully planned development is important. Uh, our city has financial challenges which has also been noted and we need to expand the tax base. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those developments have to go into the South Hills Preserve and from my perspective, uh, I don't think there's a debate as to whether the South Hills should be preserved. I think uh, we, uh, we arrived at that in different ways, but I, I hear a consensus, and I certainly support preservation of the hills. Phil? Okay, I got a lot to talk about, so. <clears throat> talk fast. Okay, I do believe that uh, prior to Measure V, Mr. Ziprick and Mr. Crispin supported development with their partnership developers and backers in the hills. When the, when the public at large passed Measure V, which imposed a lot of restrictions on development and basically sealed the fate of those developers, 
um, and Mr. Pobescu was elected to city council in lame duck session before Mr. Pobescu could be sworn in after the election, these two uh, council members voted to pay an overly inflated high cost price of $3.8 million for six point, or 675 acres of land in the hills that would not have been able to been developed because the public had spoken on Measure V. And they used monies that we could have used for other capital improvement projects here in the city to make that purchase. I believe it was inappropriate and to sit here and to say they support the hills when they clearly do not is, is upsetting to me. I think we've covered that question. And now um, here's something that is similar. Um, and it involves uh, campaign, negative campaigning. And I guess I would reword it to say, what do you consider to be negative campaigning? And we'll start with Mr. Duper. I believe negative campaigning is not telling the truth about what you do or have done or plan to do in the future. Negative campaigning is not owning up to the mistakes you may have made in the past. I would love to hear, I would love to hear uh, these, these two uh, former sitting council members, current council members say, maybe we made, made some mistakes and we're going to do things different this time. That would be impressive to me, but not owning up to the things that were done, that to me is negative campaigning. Okay, um, Ron. I believe that uh, negative campaigning uh, focuses more on personalities than on issues. Uh, it's inevitable that there are going to be differences on the issues. And that's part of what a democracy is all about. And I believe it's important to have open discourse and debate regarding issues. But we can do that without uh, focusing on, on personalities. Uh, but we should never shy away from debating the issues. at the risk of responding to a, 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 I call it a friendly charge from a colleague, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and respond because I think I was asked to. I started working on the South Hills for preservation, uh, Phil. I, I guess I'll address it to you since you did ask the question. It's a fair question. Back around 1989-1990, uh, Artis Cobes was, uh, I believe, the mayor or had been mayor. and. She was very concerned with the future of the hills. I and a lot of other people got fairly interested in trying to see them preserved, and we actually put forth an initiative, which you probably are aware of, in 1992. And we agreed even before it passed that if it did pass, it would restrict the hills development, that we would be glad to sit down with the city leaders, because many of them had concerns about it and, and were not supportive of it. And we sat down and negotiated with them a new initiative in 1996 that was supported by the council, by those who had supported the 92 initiative, and it clarified a lot of issues, but it did not acquire the hills, but it set forth in the 1996 initiative that we should try to acquire the hills. We formed a trail committee in that period. Mr. Walling, who's in the audience, was one of the original chairs. I was a chair. We had several chairs. We had co-chairs. And that committee later was given an assignment after I was on the council by Mayor uh, Karen Gaio Hansberger to study the hills and come up with what ought to be preserved. I've consistently supported that position, and I have never supported putting houses all over the hills I do not know where that comes from except from imaginations that are fertile. But if one goes and looks at the record, there's just no truth in it. So accuracy is important in eliminating negative campaigning. Thank you. Mr. Christman? Well, as I indicated in my opening statements, that uh, I felt like there was already a lot of negative accusations flying around out there. Uh, Dusty Rigsby and save, members of Save La Melinda have put out a hit piece that is very distorted and very untruthful. And I was bothered by the fact that they 
tried to take uh, so many issues and twist them beyond all imagination. Let me just pick one of them, and that had to do with the parking lot that the medical center wanted to place on, I believe it's uh, right across the street from Loma Linda Villa. Uh, when they first came to the council, they didn't want to pave that parking lot. They just wanted it to be an overflow parking lot. And the comment was made in one of these flyers that we were exacting a pound of flesh out of the medical center. But we were asking that it be paved and be done correctly and that the proper studies be done. And they themselves acknowledged the proper studies had not been done when they first presented it. So to say that we took a pound of flesh out of that pro project is just untrue. That's just one example. There was one truthful statement in there that said that I was not willing to settle lawsuits brought against the city. Uh, and they are true in that respect. I wasn't willing to settle some of the lawsuits brought against the city because I felt like they were really payoffs and I didn't want to do that. I am going to go back to Mr. Duper's comments about the hills. First of all, that was voted upon by four members of the council. If you have a problem with the city owning the land in the hills, then maybe you should put together a campaign to sell them, except they are preserved right now by the Conservancy, voted by the citizens. We did pay a fair price. It was appraised. And I don't apologize for that one single bit. I'm very proud of that purchase. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Miller. Negative campaign. Negative campaigning to me is not being realistic in a lot of areas. And further, putting people down to put yourself up. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to see it. It happens all the time in uh, big elections. But it's just like throwing mud on somebody else to raise, your own boot, raise yourself by your own bootstraps. To me, that doesn't have any place in elections. And it should be eliminated, but it probably won't ever be. So I'm not for it, and I don't plan to participate in it. Okay. Um, we're getting to the end of our questions, so if any of you has a burning one to add to the pile, you need to do that right now. Um, the next area that we're going to kind of revisit involves transparency, which has been mentioned several times by several of the candidates. Um, I would like each of you to give us your idea of what makes a transparent city government or what defines it as not very transparent was, would be another way of looking at it. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Daly. A government doesn't appear to be transparent to me when I can watch the, the uh, interactions on city council and still be confused. <laughs> uh, the issues can be complex, uh, but the most effective communicators, and we, we can all name a number of them, are able to boil issues down to uh, their simplest terms so that it's understandable to the public. Now, we can agree to disagree about uh, our perspective on those, but we need to be open and candid about that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, and again, we can use examples. Uh, I don't know, and I've, I've heard it explained to me and heard it dis debated in the uh, city council, but I, to this day, I don't understand what the relationship is, Bob, between an Amtrak station and completing Stewart Street. I understand there must be a connection there, and maybe uh, I'm just not quite sharp enough to pick it up. But those issues should be clear to the public. It's our money, as tax money, and uh, I want to be able to understand issues and understand the differences. And that's why I want to have a web page, should I be elected, so that I can explain what my positions are on certain issues as well as seek input from citizens so that there is a transparency in our relationship. Thank you. Mr. Duper. And again, I 
have to agree with Ron. Um, <clears throat> transparency is making things simple and understandable and being open with meetings and discussions and listening to feedback from citizens, from every citizen. Um, and I don't, I don't know that we have the proper channels in place to get that feedback. You know, constantly, even in this campaign, I hear, um, I hear concerns from our residents, our citizens here, and and those concerns are very important to them, and they're various concerns, and they're they're for different areas of the city, and and I feel like they feel they have not been heard. Um, transparency is an open government with access to everyone. We we do work for the people. I work for the people as it is. I understand that. I understand my position, and this isn't that far. Uh, it's not that much of a further step for me to understand. We answer to you out there for everything we do. Mr. Miller, transparency, in my estimation, is being is living above reproach, always being honest and open <coughs> and forthright, and being able to and willing to listen to others and what they have to say on the issue and then uh, discussing it on the city council so that we can all come to a meeting of the minds. Thank you. Mr. Christman. Thank you. One of the questions that came up, it's been eight or 10 years ago, was someone asked me at one of the county meetings, what made Loma Linda so different than the other cities? I've always been very proud of Loma Linda I have liked to refer to Loma Linda as the jewel of the Inland Empire because I felt like we kind of stood above what happened in other cities. We had a congenial council and I answered them and I told them that one of the things that made Loma Linda unique was that we treated each other with Christian courtesy, we treated each other with respect, we could offer different opinions and not be right or wrong. It was just a different opinion. Transparency really has to do with the fact that we have run in the past a clean government. You never saw one single headline about the city of Loma Linda where there were problems in the finance office. And I was very proud of that because that's an area that I've spent my career in is finance. We always had a transparent, good audits for the city. Uh, the city has had a good city clerk, Pam O'Cam. We've always had straightforward minutes and always had access to records. Records were always accessible to whoever wanted them. And until recently, there were never accusations against council members about secret conflicts of interest. And that bothers me because everybody files financial reports Everything's open, and just the fact that those accusations have come out means that somebody's looking for something somewhere that I don't believe is really there, or at least it hasn't been in the past. And uh, so I think that that issue is important, but I think it's been overblown a little bit by people looking for something that doesn't exist. Thank you. Well, on transparency, uh, one of the things I believe is that those of us who are serving on the council should be accessible to the citizens and visitors, residents who may not be citizens, but uh, maybe short time uh, residents in the city who uh, may not even vote here, such as students, and to gain their perspective. One of the things that has helped greatly in the last uh, maybe 15 years has been the development of the committee system. The reason for the committee system is to provide another contact point between the council and the, the citizens throughout the city. And that has been a very important means of, of garnering public opinion on a wide variety of issues. And then I think, uh, uh, I think those of us who serve on the council, I, I, I know certainly speaking for myself and I think for my colleagues, when people uh, in a smaller city like this catch you on the street corner, uh, you're going to have lots of opportunities to exchange opinion. And that's been a pretty freewheeling type discussion that has gone on on many issues in this city. I think those are 
in my view, the essence of being accessible and, and transparent. You don't make deals behind closed doors. You, you try to do things to the maximum degree, even on, on issues that are close questions on closed session items, you really try to explain to the public what is going on. And we've had some issues over that in the last year or so, which are well known to the public here. Uh, I want to respond just to one point that my good friend Ron Daly made. And uh, I guess, Ron, you remember you and I did an Amtrak project together in college. <laughs> so we go way back. <laughs> um, our town needs transportation means beyond the automobile. Stewart Street is very much tied into the transit issues. And we can talk about that more later. OK, thank you. Um, one more question. And we've touched on some of these. Uh, we. We talked about conflict of interest, but a little bit more specifically, what do you consider to be a special interest that may have some impact on Loma Linda's um, city government? And we'll start with Mr. Christman. One of the uh, issues where I have been fairly viciously attacked is where comments have been made that I was in the pockets of the developers. And that bothered me because I always thought I was a very centrist council member. And uh, one of the projects that had come before the council, I refused to go along with for years until we got the approval for commercial development along Redlands Boulevard which we finally got, and uh, that project has since fallen apart. I find it rather amusing that uh, since then, uh, the city council, is specific, specifically the redevelopment agency, has gone forward and built a very high-density apartment complex and approved a further high-density apartment complex for low and moderate income. That's going to be a total of 164 units which is the highest density this city has ever had. A three unit, I'm sorry, a three story apartment complex. And that's not something I would have been in favor of. I was more in favor of housing that would have been much lower density there. Um, but the specific question you asked had to do with conflict of interest and, and, uh, and those issues. Very specifically, I'm very concerned about the fact that Save Loma Linda got a huge payoff from the city of Loma Linda and pocketed tens of thousands of dollars, and the city now has to pay for that through either a deficit or imposing the fire paramedic tax. And I call that a significant conflict of interest that I just don't go for. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Special interest to me would be when, when somebody is trying to railroad something through and they're going to benefit in some way by so doing. And we've seen a lot of special interest at play uh, in the U.S. in government, and we've watched it play out, and we've watched a lot of lobbyists in Washington, D.C., our capital. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that it has any part. It's, it's kind of showing like preferential treatment for some but not for others. And I think everyone should be treated the same, business or individuals, and have equal opportunity in all types of businesses, not just non-profit non uh, uh, businesses, but all businesses have equal opportunity to develop, to grow, and to have uh, equal opportunity to uh, know what's going on in the city and for their benefit. Thank you. Mr. Duper? Sorry. When we talk about special interest groups, um, especially nowadays, a lot of that is hidden in what we call PACs. And PACs are committees that are formed, money is funneled into the PACs, and then it's almost laundered, like in the drug trafficking, into back their particular um, uh, you know, uh, candidate. So there are a lot of special interest groups out there. 
a lot of people have things to gain by getting close to council members and county supervisors. We read that in the paper every day now when we open up the Sun newspaper, don't we? So we don't want any of that stuff, and we definitely don't want it in our small local government. Uh, I'd like to respond to uh, Mr. Crispin as far as the um, what he called high-density housing. Um, with 32 years on the council between them, um, the state mandates that we have a certain amount of high-density housing, and our city was extremely deficient to the point we were going to get in trouble had we not rapidly tried to account for that. Now, I don't know why we didn't handle that in the last 32 years, but unfortunately it's become an issue now, and we have had to, um, to account for that. And it's, 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 um, it's just another issue of things that are having to be cleaned up from a lack of doing the right thing. When I first launched my little campaign, I, after a couple of weeks, and I'm sure this is true for the other candidates, I received a fat envelope from a builders association uh, with a lengthy questionnaire and asked that I complete that uh, and that I would be a candidate for their support. Well, I've been funding most of this myself, so a little support wouldn't hurt. But uh, when I reviewed the, the survey, it had clear biases uh, and implications that uh, I was uncomfortable with. And so I tossed it in the trash and didn't fill it out. I think to fill something like that out and, and to make promises uh, prior to even running uh, for office or before you've been elected to office, I should say, is, a, is dangerous territory to get into. Um, I've already acknowledged that some planned development is inevitable. It's going to happen, but we need to plan it carefully. I'm not against development, but I am against inappropriate lobbying. And, and I will uh, I'll support the definition that Vern suggested with one addition. I believe that if you would benefit yourself, then that would be inappropriate. But where it can get a little murky uh, and troubling is when uh, specific individuals or supporters of your campaign could potentially uh, uh, benefit as well. And I guess the old adage that we learned out of the Watergate era was follow the money. Then I guess, Ron, you'll be happy to know I have financed the last three campaigns on my own. Uh, and the, the, the fact is that Everybody who runs is going to get flyers. You're going to get you know, sleep uh, invitations where you can buy to go on a sleep mailer. There's all sorts of things you can do. And you're free to go into those or not. And um, the fact is that I have financed my own. Now, you know there are things, and the public probably knows, that there are things called independent committees. And under the law, uh, these have been tested. The United States Supreme Court has ruled that independent committees are absolutely free to campaign under the First Amendment of the United States. There have been lots of efforts to try to limit freedom of expression, and the, it's been felt nationally that you have to allow individuals to campaign forever, forever, who, for whoever they want, but you can't coordinate. And so what it is is someone can put out a flyer supporting or uh, attacking you, but if they're independent, you have nothing to say about it, and it's the same with all of us. The other thing I do need to respond to is uh, uh, calling Mr. Duper. The RDA, uh, which I have been part of for some years, has worked extremely hard to build uh, low and moderate income houses. One of the issues that uh, did come up some years ago, and we got criticized for by uh, perhaps some supporters of yours, uh, from Save Loma Melinda is that we were trying too hard to comply. That comment was made to me at one time. I don't know that that would be the position of Save Loma Melinda now, as some of them are on the council and are finding out that we absolutely have to comply with the state law. So I want to be gentle on that point, but at the time, that was one of the points we were uh, hit pretty hard on, was we were building all these homes that would be for low and moderate home, uh, you know, type people, and we had to do it. Thank you. Well, we've run out of questions and we're running out of time, so it's finally time.
time to wrap this up. And um, as we mentioned earlier, the closing statements will be three minutes each. And we'll begin with the last person who spoke uh, in the opening round. And uh, then I'll have a few things to say to wrap up after that. So we'll start with Mr. Ziprick and his closing statement. Thank you very much. And again, thanks to your organization and the Chamber of Commerce for conducting this as you have in, in past elections. There's one brief point I want to make because uh, I, I, this is the last chance, I guess, to address something you raised, Ron. When the Centennial Building was built, it had a requirement for a crosswalk with a light. And that light didn't get put in as soon as the building was finished. And that may have led to the incidents that you're speaking of. The light is in now. And uh, again, my position is the offer is always open to come back and revisit how to finance, if you don't want to call it a tunnel, a bridge. But there's some questions that have to be answered. And maybe this goes to the town and gown issue. And maybe that's the big issue. Who should own the, who should own the bridge? That has to be determined. And that's never been answered. And that's a very important legal issue because who patrols it, who controls it is, is huge. You can't sign a contract, as you know, between a private entity and a government, even in a close town like this, without having those loose ends cleared up. And that is something that has never been done. So we should be open to, to looking at that again. And uh, if, if that's something the town would like to do, I'm ready to support it. But there's some loose ends that have got to be explored. Looking at the long term, I think the growth of our community has been greatly based upon the growth of the institutions. We need to certainly, as a lot have said, diversify, bring in some other sources of income. I think we need to develop our for-profit sector, but try to do things that are compatible with that type of high-tech industry. I think that would be a very good thing to do. I think that um, we should have a goal as a community because we are a minor convention center. In fact, we're probably a regional convention center. We have numerous meetings here every year of all types. And people who are visitors here often say, I don't know what amenities I can take advantage of. Our Chamber of Commerce has done a great job producing some pretty nice maps. And the new trail map is on there and points of interest, things like that. The campus map is on there. But I would like to aim for the goal that if people are forced to come here because they are coming to a convention, they need health care, they're getting their education, they will wish they could stay because they will find the culture, the amenities, uh, our recreational facilities so attractive, they'll say, I wish I didn't have to leave. And that would be my goal going forward if I'm reelected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Christman. Thank you. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters for this opportunity. I'm glad the citizens get to see and hear the answers to some of the questions. First of all, I'm proud of Loma Linda. I'm proud of the fact that we've beautified the city over the last few years. If you recall, even Barton Road used to be just palm trees and dirt. We now have a beautiful area of flowers and plants and shrubbery through Barton Road. And we've done a lot to beautify the city, a lot to make the parks in the city look nice. Uh, Holder Crooks Park uh, has been expanded significantly. We built the Bryn Mawr Veterans Memorial Park. And regardless of who you vote for on June 8th, please vote. It's your democracy, it's your vote, it's your opportunity to determine the future of the city. One of the things that I've always been very forceful on doing is to balance the budget. And I think this budget can be balanced without raising taxes. As a matter of fact, I think it can be balanced by even rescinding the fire paramedic tax, which I don't think this council should have imposed on the citizens. I think we already pay enough taxes that should include public safety, and that's one that I believe should not be a separate tax. 
I think we need to work hard on bringing more businesses in, especially along Redlands Boulevard. The for-profit sector will help the entire city grow financially, and that will help benefit everybody in town, not just the citizens, but also the nonprofit institutions. I will point out I have no conflicts of interest. I don't work for the sheriff's office. I can vote on the budget. I don't work for the university. I can vote on any of their issues. But most important, I want to make this, to use George Bush Sr.'s terms, a kinder, gentler city. I want a council that can work together. I want to bring back the old Loma Linda, where we work together for the good of the city, not to try to find some little issue to use as the next campaign target issue. And by making the city a kinder, gentler city, I think the citizens will be proud of this council. And that's what we need, the citizens to be proud of the council, to be proud of the city, and I'm certainly proud of Loma Linda, and I will strive to have a congenial council that works together for the good of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miller. I second a lot of those, a lot of those items that uh, you mentioned also, Bob. I too believe that the council can be, re be best represented if we listen to each of you and that we have openness and understanding on the various issues, we have diligence in studying the issues, and this will bring good results for the city and for the citizens of Loma Linda. I've worked quite a bit with the proton therapy people and the follow-up work with them and potlucks and one thing or another, and the feelings that they have when they leave Loma Linda and while they're in progress in their proton treatment is unbelievably good. They think this is a wonderful place. They enjoy the doctors, all the attendants that work with them in taking the proton therapy treatment. And they have a lot of good things to say about Loma Linda. And uh, when they give their parting remarks, they, many of them have tears in their eyes because they've just been treated so well. I would like to see that spread beyond the proton therapy people to the citizens of the city so that when people come here and have contact with any of us or any business in this area, that they will have the same feelings and walk away knowing that somebody really sincerely cared about them more than about themselves. And I think that is achievable. Thank you. Mr. Duper. Well, first off, um, I, uh, I just want to say I, I am enjoying this, and I really like everybody up here. Um, I, I'm having fun talking about these issues. Um, unfortunately, they are serious issues, and they require serious thought. Um, as a law enforcement officer, I have dealt in the most extreme situations, and, and I pride myself in being a problem solver. Unfortunately, when I respond to a call or I deal with a situation, I have to make a decision quickly. It's not something I can mull over or talk about or, you know, spend time on. I usually have to make quick decisions. And sometimes I'm criticized for that. Sometimes I make the right one. Sometimes I don't. But my thing here is, is I think we need to move forward. I love this city also. I was born here. I was born in the university uh, at the medical center. I love living here. I'm very proud of it also, and I brag to my friends about living here. Um, Mr. Crispin made a comment when he was talking about the Anderson 210 interchange and dealing with sandbag. And he made the comment to the effect of uh, there are other cities that were pushing for their projects harder. And he said himself, obviously, we haven't been pushing hard enough. And that's what I want to do. The old guard is tired. They've been here too long. They're spending too much time just sitting and doing nothing. We are going to ramp it up. We are going to get projects accomplished in this city, and we are going to take care of the people and the citizens. That's what I intend to do, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Daly. Thank you. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I know that there are projects that are left unfinished that we're all familiar with that we've discussed uh, at some point in the discussion this evening. Uh, we still have the traffic congestion, particularly at the 10 Anderson uh, freeway interchange. Uh, 
uh, I first learned and saw the initial drawings on the project in 1970, or pardon me, 1987. Now it's 2010. Uh, it, it first troubles me that the project hasn't been completed. It troubles me even more that I don't know what the status of the project is or an anticipated completion date when we can look forward to a little better streaming of traffic uh, at that particular intersection. Um, I know that uh, we have good businesses in Loma Linda. I also know we have a lot of land that has not been developed. Uh, most of us, I'm sure, shop at the new uh, uh, mall in Redlands where they've got anchor stores like Target and Kohl's and so forth. Uh, I'm not aware of how much initiative has been put forward to try to attract a Barnes and a Noble, uh, a Trader Joe's, and that level of business to, to a more uh, upscale city by comparison with our surrounding uh, neighbors. Uh, and I would be committed to working hard with other councilmen and citizens to attract more business uh, to Loma Linda. So there are projects and, and challenges that we have that we're all aware of that need increased focus and attention. And most of all, we come back to the transparent leadership in the sense that there needs to be open communication so that if there are good reasons why projects don't complete it, then everyone needs to be familiar with what those reasons are. We've discussed many issues tonight, uh, but my focus continues to be on the four fundamental issues that uh, we uh, elaborated on a little earlier. Transparent leadership, promoting economic development, maintain the highest level of public safety, and improve the transportation network. If we can make significant headway in the coming four years in those projects, then I will feel very pleased about my four years on the City Council. Um, I uh, thank you for supporting this uh, American election tradition tonight. Uh, I invite you to join me in a discussion of the question, what do we want for the city of Loma Linda? Uh, I'm confident we will find solutions to our challenges and be able to define an exciting vision for the future. And uh, it would be my privilege and great honor to serve you as a councilman in the city and I appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Okay, now is the time for applause. A big hand. And you should also give yourself a hand for the good questions. Um, I was so glad that we had um, so many questions that we covered a lot of area tonight and I hope you learned something from this. Um, of course, Many of you are probably here supporting a particular candidate, and that's fine, too. And as was pointed out, the important thing is that you vote, either by mail or by going to the polls. And uh, let's make this a big turnout in the June election. Uh, I also want to mention that there is a repeat that there is voter information on the ballot measures and on the statewide candidates on the back ledge. And um, you can also access some, <clears throat> some websites that will give you more information, particularly about the propositions, who's behind it and so on. And many of you probably got your um, official uh, ballot guide uh, this week and um, may need some help uh, deciphering what those propositions really mean. Um, <clears throat> so there is plenty of information out there that you can access. I want to thank, again, the Chamber for their help in arranging this. And um, to my assistant, uh, Mary Saxon Hobbs, for her good question gathering and sorting. And um, I think that uh, <clears throat> that is that is going to cover everything that I had written down. So thank you again for <clears throat> coming and for your uh, courteous attention, and thank the candidates for taking their time to express their views too. I would like to thank the San Bernardino <clears throat> League of Women Voters for moderating this program this evening and each of the participants. Let's all give them a.
Okay. Thank you very much.